thank you all for coming. So let's get started. This is rewriting critical software in Elixir eight case study, and my name is Hernan Hanelli. I am from Brazil. Actually, I am based in São Paulo. I've been working with Elixir since two thousand fifteen, um, and before. Before that, I did lots of Ruby, Python, C Sharp, and lots of other different stuff. I currently work for Telnix. Telnix is a Chicago-based company. I'm going to talk a bit about Telnix right now. Uh, it's a bit difficult to explain Telnix to people that know nothing about telephony and 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 how the, the telecommunications work um, ha happen work. But I, I like to say that. That, that's actually the way that they sold to me in an interview. Like, can you imagine a data center, what AWS is to a data center? Telnex tries to be that for the telecommunications world. So with all the stuff that we have at Telnex, you can build your own carrier. Like, we, we've got a global network. We are able to um, connect calls and, and transfer media across uh, all, of the, all of those lines that you see, all the dots are points of presence. Th this picture is a bit outdated, but it conveys the idea that we are a, glo a global company and we have points of presence all across the globe. And if you want to make a phone call from Sydney to, say, uh, Washington, D.C., you can get your call ingressed in Sydney and make it egress out of D.C. And you would say, well, why, why would I want that? The reason is you won't go to the internet, so it's safer, it's better quality, which matters if you want to hear what, what, I, what someone is saying. It has better latency, so uh, whenever I have to work with people here in Europe, I'm from Brazil, and our internet is not as good as yours, to say the least. And there is a, a lot of, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of latency that happens, and, and there's those awkward silences that are not actually happening, but are the 500 milliseconds between. Uh, a packet gets out of my computer to your computer, and then we don't know which one is talking, and then there's that, uh, 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 please continue, no, please, you, you, continue, please. That happens because latency sucks, and if you were not going through the internet, if you're going to a private network, latency is better, so you can do better phone calls. That's one of the things that we do. We do a lots, lots of other stuff, but I'm going to focus here on, on the voice product, and I'm going to say that Tonics is hiring, and if you want to work for a global uh, infrastructure provider. Uh, my boss is somewhere, he, he was there, but then he, he moved, but you can talk to him. <laughs> and yeah, I'm also, uh, j just, a, just a, a quick mention, I'm also an organizer of the Elixir Sao Paulo meetup. It's probably the biggest meetup in the Southern Hemisphere, and we try to do monthly meetups. And we are failing miserably at that this year, but we're gonna get better. Uh, so let's get let's get started with the real talk. Rewriting critical software in Elixir. First, I want to do is a disclaimer that uh, every time someone talks about uh, a case study or something that is specific to their context, you should always listen in the light of their context. So what makes sense to me might not make the slightest sense to you, and that's okay. Uh, if that's the case, let, let's talk, let's share ideas, and, and maybe we can find some common ground. Also, I have did a little bit of editing on, on how the things went so that it would fit in a presentation and it wouldn't be overwhelmingly complex to those of you that are listening. So uh, some facts have been omitted and some things have been slightly changed and I won't tell you which is which. So first, let's start, let's start talking about context and motivations. Um, it is very common in, in w when you're going to a new programming language or a new uh, whatever new technology that people want to use the thing, but you probably already work in a company that makes money because you were employed and you make money, so probably someone is giving your company money, and probably you have something already in place. So you can try every new shining thing and Many people come to me and say, well, I want to rewrite this thing in Elixir. And we, we did that to some extent. And, and now I'm going to share a bit of our context of why we, we felt a rewrite was needed. What were the things that motivated us to do so? So first, I'm going to share a, the slightest minimum that you need to know about telephony is that 
there is, can you, can you see the, the cursor? Okay, so there is a user on this end, Alice, that wants to call Bob and wants to do that over an IP network. And there's a thing called the SIP protocol that is to the communications world like what HTTP is to us. Like it's the, the bread and butter. And there's a thing in, in a telephony world called the B2B UA, the back-to-back -back user agent that you, you actually, when you, Alice is calling Bob, there are actually two media streams happening. Alice is not directly talking to Bob. Alice is talking to the B2B UA, and the B2B UA is talking to Boris. There are very many reasons why that is a good idea, and I won't go into that because I don't think everyone is as interested in telephony as I am. So th that is pretty much all you need to know. Both parties will try, will use the protocol to def define what a session will look like, what are the media protocols, what are, is there going to be transcoding or whatever. And there's a point where they will start to trade, to, to exchange media packets until someone says bye and be done with it. And the, the service that I'm going to talk about today is called the dial plan service. The dial plan service is the thing that tells the B2B way what to do when it receives a call. So you can imagine that pretty much all the business logic involving in connecting and, and billing and doing anything at all with a call, we end up touching the dial plan service. And what the dial plan service actually do is, it, it, it's a regular, kind of like a regular web application. The only difference is instead of, uh, returning HTML, it returns a program written in XML. And this is specific to the, the, um, to the, to the soft switch that we use in our back-to-back -back user agent that is called free switch. And I, I, I won't talk about free switch here. The important thing to know is that there is like a, an XML that tells the, 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 the switch what to do. So in this case, it's setting some variables in, in the channels, exporting some variables, and bridging a call. This is what says bridge Alice calls to Bob's calls. This, and we can, you can do like all sorts of crazy stuff. This is a ridiculously non-functional and minimal dial plan, regular dial plan. Maybe I'll show you a real one afterwards, but the idea is that the dial plan is going to return a markup language that tells the, the switch what to do, pretty much what an H, the HTML tells the browser what to show. So you can think of the dial plan as a regular web application for all senses. And some characteristics that are interesting to, to point out, the dial plan is almost stateless, not completely stateless, but th there are some bits of state mainly regarding rate limiting and blocking fraud and, and all, all of that, but not in, 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 I, in an ideal situation, there would, it, it would be stateless, right? And another thing is that it is super latency sensitive. Why is that? Whenever you are going from Alice to Boris, it's Boris, not Bob, wow. So from Alice to Boris, it's not that Alice is directly calling the B2B way. Actually, there is a very complex engine of things that integrate vendors because you, sometimes you don't have a direct route to a number, but you do have a partner. So you need to route that through many, many proxies and, and all sorts of complex stuff. And, sometimes, and, and that takes time. And the moment that you dial something and you're waiting, it's that mute, silent moment that you don't know if your phone's broken, if the carrier sucks, or whatever. So you need to connect the call as fast as you can. And if you think about someone that has a call center, for example, the time that the, the, the agent is not talking is wasted money. So if you're able to call and connect as fast as you can, you can save money, the, the, many, many reasons to do so. so the dial plan service is much more latency sensitive than it is from a throughput, throughp, than it is throughput sensitive. So we don't have that high of a throughput. It's uh, probably in, in, in the house of a couple thousand requests per box, which is not impressive. 
the impressive thing is that we need to coordinate talking to many, many, many services and do all of that in under 100 milliseconds. That's our goal. I, I talked to like 14, 15 different services through HTTP and I need to have the answer to everything super as fast as possible. So it's, it's a bit of a different challenge that, than we have in regular web, web applications. Regular web applications. Another thing that, uh, and now to, to the real motivation stuff, the, the, the piece of software that we were rewriting, and I call that the Python situation, to, to make it like impressive. The, the, the piece of software that we were, was re rewriting was written in Python, and from now on, I refer to that as the Python dial plan, as opposed to the Elixir dial plan that is the new one, the rewritten version. And one thing that is very specific to our, to our context is that all the Python engineers ended up moving out of tele uh, telephony to go to other teams. And I am not 100% familiar as to the reasons why. My boss is pro probably is. So uh, it, it, ha it happens that we ended up not having that many experienced Python developers in the team. Another thing that happened is that Python is notoriously, notoriously harder to scale vertically and horizontally than Elixir. And we are, we are Tonics are at a moment that we are growing up fast. We are, at, at that moment, all startups want to be that they start to grow and scale. And scaling this service that you can imagine, the thing that tells the switch where to put the call is probably a very important thing for someone that runs the business on selling calls, right? So w w we, wa we wanted to, um, we were anticipating problems that we were going to have um, by in, in scale and, and resource um, efficiency. Another thing that, uh, that also happened is that the, the, pro the project was one of the first projects in the company and it was growing harder and harder to maintain, harder and harder to operate for various reasons. And with the removal of the old team, we, we ended up losing lots of, of knowledge. And a rewrite is a very good moment to reclaim knowledge on, 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 on how the, the, the system works. And I'm going to show that throughout the presentation. So we ended up with, with this situation, we ended up deciding, let's rewrite the service in Elixir. We also have, uh, I think today, 12 or 14 Elixir developers or something like that. Okay. Probably something like that, and we, we, we had a desire to do more and more stuff in Elixir, especially in the telephony side. Okay, so we, had, we decided that, but, but how do you rewrite such a thing? There is no recipe to rewrite. I've, I've been through, through a few myself, and all of them looked completely different. So this, this is the, 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 the first big question in such a project. So I'm gonna give a quick, uh, uh, a very high level overview of our journey in doing so, and then I'm gonna detail each of the steps. So first we needed to get the buy-in from the business stakeholders, right? We need to, yeah, stop talking. We need to convince the business that it was a good idea to slow down feature development, to slow down stuff so that we could rewrite this project. We needed to reserve resources, like commit uh, human resources for the project. You can't do a rewrite at this scale if your engineers are doing like eight different stuff. You need, this, this is a very hard problem, it's very time sensitive, I'm, I'm gonna talk about that. And you, you need to, to commit resources. Then we needed to write code and deploy it, right? Put it in production, sh show the word to it, and it, we, we use a technique called shadow deploy, shadow deployment, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna describe that as well. And if we are doing a rewrite, we need to make sure that the old piece of software and the new piece of software have feature parity. You don't want to rewrite something while also putting new stuff, because when you're rewriting, it is, very possible that things might go wrong, that you might miss an edge case, that you might break something, that a deploy might, might go wrong. And if you're putting new features in the rewrite, it's gonna be a, a lot harder to have the ability to roll it back. So we don't, we don't want to, we, we didn't want to um, 
to go that route, so it would be easier to have feature parity. And all of that had to happen while handling production traffic, like handling uh, millions of calls and all of that. And all of that while um, and all of that while the company was growing. So the sooner that we could finish the project, the better we could spend our resources in scaling a, a, a thing that is easier to scale compared to uh, the old software. So uh, in order to convince uh, business stakeholders of the value of such project, it is fundamental that you phrase the benefits in business terms. Business people, they don't know and they shouldn't know the technicalities of our development work, right? We need to communicate what are our needs and, 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 and what we can provide. And in order to do that effectively, effectively in my experience, it's, it's much better if you say, okay, if we go to that route in the future, the customers will have this, this, and that better metric. If we go that route, we'll have a better quality of service, then we can charge more, and then we can grow, and we can be competitive, and, and all of that. It, it is important to, to get the buying in those terms instead of just, yeah, the software is hard to maintain. My life sucks. Like, and then he's going to say, well, if you stop building features, my life is going to suck because I'm not going to sell. Who wins now? Right? And, and, and probably the salespeople are going to win because they, they, got, they bring the money. And it's very hard to compete with them. After that, about committing resources, we, we got to the approval for, for one full-time developer. The, yeah, one full-time developer. Put in an S, won't make them two. And it is important that you try not to put lots of responsibilities on, on top of the same person because a, re a rewrite is a very hard thing to do. You need to understand some, why something is the way it is in a moment that that knowledge is, is the least available. So um, I've been in projects that didn't do this and they failed miserably. So uh, please, if you want to do a rewrite uh, and you can't get the, the commitment to, to put the work in it, it's better if you don't go that route. Now, after that, we need to write the code and deploy. One thing that I, that we, 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 we had, the, the way to, we want to put our new system in production as soon as possible, right? We want to show it production traffic as soon as possible and start to verify if it is behaving like the old service as soon as possible. The way we, the strategy that we devised to do that is, is like this. We put a proxy uh, on, on front of the, of the old service, and we started to log all of the requests and all of the responses to Greylog. Right? There is nothing special about Greylog. It's just the thing that we were using at the time for storing logs. And we also started to duplicate the same request that goes to the old service to the new service, but we just ignore the response. We just, since it's a stateless application, we, we, we have the possibility to do such a thing. We can replicate the requests and, and, and since they are stateless, they should be the same, right? It's like functional programming. And then we started to log both responses. So Greylog became our operational database. And to give an idea of, of what we will do with that database, this is completely, uh, it's just to convey the idea that Greylog doesn't accept SQL, unfortunately. So the idea is that we are going to join the table of the Python dial plan logs with the Elixir dial plan logs per call. So I'm gonna join for, for a given call and I'm going to extract the XML dial plans, the request, when the return XML is different, right? So we, we build a thing that would be doing the equivalent of that on top of Greylog and storing all of the all of the tuples that showed a discrepancy, like the the old service is doing something different than the new one. It might be that the new one is screwing up. It might be that many different reasons. 
And we ended up, in, in order to verify the difference, we used a diff tool that would show us this. So for every difference that we saw, we would generate one of these, look at the dial plan, and try to figure out why it's different. And, as, and early on, we realized that most of the differences were caused by non-critical downstream failures. As I mentioned, there are many uh, services that the dial plan needs to consult to, do the, the, to, to create the actual dial plan. But sometimes one, one or another fails and, 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 we can, and since we need to connect the call anyway, we always try to fall back and, and, and use other strategies. So the dial plan might look a bit different, but when you replay the, the, the request, then they, they look the same. And, that, and the other uh, most uh, common case was that, um, and, and when that was not the case, we, could, we, we needed to record the, the, the response of each dependency. Like, is, is anyone here that ever used the Ruby VCR gem? Quite a few people. So it's the same idea. Like, instead that you're running this on your test, you're running this in production. So you would log all of the responses of all your dependencies so that you can inspect them afterwards. And one thing that we realized is if I have all that information, I can rep, just like with VCR, I can replicate that in a test set. So by doing that, we were getting for free a, a hugely extensible regression uh, set. So I, I'm going to show you uh, this trick that I do. Is after every request, I log a line that is actually a bash script that I can just copy and paste, and bam, then I have a regression scenario. So it's super convenient that you can do that, and then you replicate and, and figure out your mistakes. So it, it's a trick. It, it's, it's kind of like cheating. You are logging code, but it, it was very helpful for us. Um, OK, let's get back. Oh, and the result of that is that for every edge case that we found, we created a regression scenario. And all of the, 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 the resulting dial plans are stored in the product as dial plan XML. There is quite a few of them. So if we count them, you see that there is quite a lot. Imagine having to make sure that a new deployment doesn't break any of such cases. There is a, of course, there is a lot of redundancy since it's very easy to create a new scenario, I tend up to be very liberal about it. So sometimes there, there, I, I, I did like write two or three equivalent scenarios to the same thing. But since we, we need to, the, our API is very, um, how, can, how can I say that? It doesn't change a lot because we are writing a program to a switch. So no customers, oh, why don't we change this name to that name? We, we don't have that option. And, and so it's, it's a lot easier to maintain such very strict and, and very rigid uh, test scenarios because they don't change at all. All I need to know is that I, can, I still conf, um, confirm to all, to all of them. And there's also some tricks to update all of them. If, for example, I want to change the way we I just want to change the name of a variable that I use for billing. I'm going to change all the dial plans. I don't want to do all of that manually. So there is a trick that will rewrite the regression scenario. But as you can imagine, if you do it wrong, it's going to break the scenario. Right. And we kept doing that thing. We, we get the, the, the stuff from production. We find a discrepancy. OK, fix that. And most of the times, when you get a discrepancy, all of them were the, are the same. So you fix that, they don't show up, you see the next one, and you keep doing that until, you know, we kept doing that until the discrepancies were gone, right? Until there was one day that we ran a whole, a whole day in production and all of the dial plans were exactly the same. And this is familiar, and, and I want to, to make a quick prov provocation here. This is, 
I think everyone has seen this, the, the very familiar TDD cycle, right? You write a failing test, you make the test pass, and you refactor. We are doing pretty much the same thing but in a different phase of the software development. When we talk about TDD, we are mostly talking about a design technique to give you feedback on your code. And this time, we are using this very same strategy, a very equivalent one, to give us feedback, not in the design of the code, but give us feedback whether we are feature pair, feature pair or not with the old service. So, the write of failing test would be capture a failing scenario, fix and create a regression, and then you can rewrite more stuff until there are no more stuff to rewrite, right? That's pretty much the meat of, of what we did, right? And now I'm gonna talk about what were our outcomes? What did we actually achieve while doing that? So uh, I am very proud to say that we had pretty much zero incidents in production after the cutover, like incidents in production related to us not being feature pair with the old service, right? Uh, we, we, we had very few incidents of those, and when we did, it was like a one hour time to get it diagnosed, fixed, and deployed. We ended up having a, a much better runtime to, to run our service on. Uh, I, 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 I believe that the Bean is much nicer than the Python runtime. And it's also a 100% Elixir code base. Uh, there was a huge improvement in observability, uh, both because we took, we had to, 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 to take our time doing that, and also because Elixir is awesome. So we ended up building lots of dashboards that I don't want to. I am not going to show, but there is one interesting thing that I, I I always like to show to people that never saw. Have 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 a, Does anyone here never heard of Observer? Okay, most people have heard of Observer, and there's a web version of Observer called Web Observer. And if you put that in your application, like mixed apps Observer, you get the observer on a web interface, and, and this is, is actual production. So I, I, I could get here in, in a process and just like click to kill it. I won't do it because not, especially not in front of my boss, but I could if I wanted to. And this is super awesome because you get a list of processes, ports, and, and there were times that we introduced a process leak and it was super duper fast to find out, oh yeah, I see what this, this module name is, I messed up, let's fix it. And in other platforms, it's, uh, it's not as easy. And, and this is one of, one of the outcomes that we get for having our stuff in Elixir. Um, let's continue, I, I think I... Also, I, I, don't, I don't have uh, graphs or anything else other than my word to, to base this claim, but features started to ship faster, right? Because, well, we, 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 we reclaimed the knowledge on, uh, for, on the project. We had a very extensive uh, regression set, and we were more comfortable in putting more stuff in production and testing stuff in production. Parallelization was ridiculously simpler and cheaper to achieve. Like in the, in the Py no Python code, there was an effort to make stuff more parallel so that we would reduce the total latency, but it was much harder to achieve the stuff that we can do with Elixir because Elixir is awesome and I don't need to sell it to you because you're all, you, you're all here and you're probably all aware of its merits, but parallelization was much simpler to implement, and it was much safer, and ultimately it leads to less latency and happier users. Now, uh, I think I, um, I'm past uh, half my time. Now I'm gonna talk about the non-glorious parts. I'm gonna talk about the times that we screwed up, and yeah. So we didn't do a, the best job in managing business expectations. Like, it, there, there was a lot of, of of, how, how can I say that? that? There was a lot of expectative on, on, on the results of such product. And, and I think that maybe people got overly excited of what this would mean. So it's important that when you're doing a rewrite, you always make sure what you are not doing. 
because I have seen this in the past. Like you go and you you finish a re it's already hard enough to be successful in a rewrite. It it's the only one mistake you shouldn't commit a card to Joe Spolsky. And it's, it's already hard enough. And then you go and say, yeah, we're finished. We've done it. And, and if the business comes and say, yeah, but what about that other thing? And I, no, no, we, we didn't agree to that. No, I thought that you were going to do that thing. Oh, but I didn't say it. That, that's bad. It, it's not exactly what happened in our, in our case. I'm going to talk, talk more about that later. But it could happen. It happened to me previously, and it could happen to you. We also were very dumb in sampling the verification um, uh, discrepancies. We ended up being very exhausted. We thought, okay, that how long could it take, right? And it took a long time. And we should be have been smarter into identifying things that were the same, because sometimes you would fix an issue and create another, and then fix an issue and create another and create another. And after you you fix like five or six different things, oh man, I'm going in circles here. I'm, I'm so if if we were smarter in, in the verification sample, you could have seen more than one discrepancy at a time. Uh, our dedicated resources ended up not being as dedicated as we expected or wanted because startups, right? Um, there's a lot of responsibility all across the place. So I think we could have done better. I, I was not the person that started a project. I ended up uh, arriving roughly like why it was 80% done before before starting rolling out to actual production traffic. And that made the, the situation a lot better. But the, the, the guy that was working with me with me before, he, he, he was a bit stressed about not being able to flux as much. Uh, the Python, and, 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 and this is, I think, the most important thing. The Python code base kept moving forward at the same time we were doing the rewrite. And this is something that it's very hard to avoid doing because the business needs to move forward. The business need to, um, you need to implement features to win customers, right? If a customer comes to you and say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit like $20,000 a month, but I need this feature. Um, it's not smart if you say, oh, I, I can't do this feature right now. I'm doing a rewrite, <laughs> right? We, we as developers should, we shouldn't cope with that. But, uh, and that's why we, we need the rewrite to happen as fast as possible. You, you need the transition period to be the short, should the, sh the short, as short as possible. And when I said that we had almost zero incidents in production, it wasn't zero because some stuff ended up being introduced while we were running, so we didn't have the same amount of stress and it, the, the users were not using that much. So this is a, if you're willing to do a rewrite, this is a risk you need to consider. If the old project is going to keep moving forward, you need to make sure that you, that you will be able to eventually uh, get to, to the same point where you can, you can do the full switch. And we were 98% complete for way too long. Um, D David probably remembers that quite well. We, we would say, yeah, it's going to be ready this week. And next week, it was gonna be, it's going to be ready this week. And yeah, he wasn't too happy about that. So, um, and, and that happened mostly because in, in the verification part, it took much longer for us to zero out all the edge cases. When we got, when the queue was starting to, to drain, the, the number of discrepancies, they started to get harder and harder. And they started, the fix would break other stuff that we did not anticipate. So th th this, this is also a risk. You need to put some effort into reporting progress. Um, very well, not to create a situation where you've spent 20% of your time to get it to 98% and 80% of the time to do 2%. That sucks. Also, um, trying to fix gnarly code in the wrong phase of the TDE-ish cycle. One thing that we learn is sometimes when you look at a code and it's very complex and you, and you can't really understand what's going on, Maybe it's just better to just translate that 
in the new language. Because if you try to reason why something is weird, you're probably gonna to guess wrong. And and then you start to fix the fix and and and, and it and it ends up taking a lot of time. So my suggestion is if if you find some pieces of code that you can understand why they are, try to copy, encapsulate, and isolate as much as possible, but try to have that as close as possible to the original code because if that creates a bug, uh, a discrepancy, you will need to understand both sides. And the more different both sides are, the harder will be your job and the longer it will take and your boss will be less happy, right? So wrapping up, was it worth it? And, 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 and that is, uh, I don't think there is an universal metric that'll say, yes, it was better or worse, that there won't be a number to say that. I personally think that it was very much worth it because we, we were able to keep up with scale, we were able to ship features faster, and we were able to do it successfully. We were able to decommission the old service. Uh, there is no mention to the old service in, in our repository. It's like it never existed. An important lesson is go to production as early and as often as you can. There is no substitution to real production traffic, especially if you have uh, the kind of situation that, that we, we do with a very complex domain and, and many uh, edge cases and there are many snowflake customers that do this and that thing differently. If you ever talk to someone that do support like SIP support, you see that those guys, they know a lot of stuff that can go wrong. The, the SIP protocol is very complex and there are many edge cases. So if you have a situation like this, go to production, and even if you don't, go to production as early and as often as you can. Monitoring and observability pay off. You should never be afraid of testing stuff in production. This is controversial. I know that some people tend to think that you should be able to remove all the bugs before it ever hits the user. And if you're going to, like nowadays, many people are going to microservices, architectures, and all of that. And I think in those situations, it's, e it's even more important that you should test in production. You should be able to assess the health of your running system, you should be able to test hypotheses in the running system, you should be able to maneuver your system in various ways, right? If you wanna do something that might have a performance impact, you need to be able to not use that performance impacting stuff. And that puts a lot of pressure in, in the operations. Also, um, refactoring is way easier than rewriting. When I, when I showed the, the, that cycle, like when you get a failing scenario, you fix it, and then you, you, you rewrite, it's the same thing that you will do if you're doing a refactor. What's the difference between a refactor and a rewrite in my definition? A refactor happens in place. It happens in the same project, in the same deployment. A rewrite is a different thing. You're gonna, it, it doesn't matter if it's in the same language or a different language, but a rewrite is a new system that's gonna pose as the previous one. The refactor is just the same thing, right? And rewriting is hard and dangerous, but it's possible, provided that you are able to do it in a controlled and safe manner in production, right? Now, I want to drag a final reflection in the few minutes that I have. The, the, probably there is someone out there that, that is thinking, okay, you, you thought about how to do the, the how, much, how much time do I have? Like, yeah? Okay, so I'm gonna go real fast. So you can say, okay, you, you thought, you, you, you walked us through of the process of rewriting the thing, but, how can you say that the, re the Elixir rewrite will not end up in the same situation as the previous code, right? There, there are people that would say, well, you, you, your organization ended up creating a, a project that were in that situation. Why we will not do it again? Now, I wanna say that I think that the merit 
of Elixir is that it saves us not a huge amount of time in anything. I personally believe that exper an experienced team in any language is able to achieve the things that we achieve with Elixir. Like Netflix is built on Java, there's people building lots of stuff in Node.js and, 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 and in any platform that you can think. What Elixir does differently, in my opinion, is that it saves us a little bit of time in many, many situations. Not a huge amount of time in one specific situation, maybe that is, but in this case, it saves us a small amount of time in many places. We don't need to think, oh, what is the data access library that I need to use? Oh, of course, it's Acto. Acto is really good. What is the logging library that I need to use? Use Elixir Logger. So Elixir brings us many small improvements. And I think that having all of those small improvements in place ends up being a big help so that we can spend more time in the stuff that really matters that is ensuring maneuverability, ensuring observability, ensuring that our software does the thing that it's supposed to do, that it fully utilizes all your resources, including humans. Thank you. Well done, yeah. <laughs>